and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, together with my co-host, Bethany Ruff. Hello, hello. Welcome to the show. Always stoked when you can jump on with us. And today we have another amazing guest to introduce to you now. Jen Brazelton is the owner of In Love Birthing, LLC. Jen is a certified doula and a certified childbirth educator focused on helping to empower women to create their own unique and natural birthing plan. Through her company, she works with all families, both in person in the greater Washington, D.C. area, or virtually with people all over the world. She has also created several educational courses, which are available on her website. Jen is a U.S. Army veteran, lives with her husband and four kiddos, and loves all things birthy or fluffy. <laughs> I love that, birthy and fluffy. Jen Brazelton, <laughs> such an honor. Welcome to the show. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. How are you both doing? We are doing great. How are you? I am excellent. Thank G you, Brad. Give us an example of something fluffy that that, that is uh, something you like. It's the first thing that comes to mind. So I have this four foot teddy bear in my office that I use to cuddle with when I am researching or having a hard day. I love that. That's great. <laughs> That's a good fluffy thing to like. Well, we are super happy to talk to you today. This is a topic um, that I think so many people need to know more about. Um, we were introduced to this kind of concept several years ago, and it's just there's not a lot of awareness around it. And so we wanted to have you on to just kind of talk about the things you do and things that people can um, be thinking about when they're planning their families and, and know what options they have. But first and foremost, we want to you know learn about you and learn about how you became interested in birthing. Fantastic. Um, so I became interested in birthing really around the time when I got pregnant with my first son. I had already been in the military for about 10, 11 years, and I knew there was a conflict of interest with my military career and raising a family. Uh, because of my, uh, I will describe them as internal settings, uh, I, I approached life <laughs> from a from a little bit more of an aggressive standpoint. And I didn't want to give birth to my son while, you know, cussing my husband out. And so I chose the route of hypno babies, which is a hypnosis approach to childbirth. I had a fantastic experience. We got, uh, and at this time we were um, living overseas in Germany. And so I, I had a fantastic experience. I got to the hospital. I was already nine centimeters within the hour. I'm pushing baby out. And in my head, everybody should birth like this because it was a great experience. And then I, I at the same time, I was, wor I was friends with about 10 other women, which is crazy, who were all pregnant at the same time. And I was the only one who actually got the natural birth that they were looking for uh, and the big difference was my ability to prepare for it, whereas, you know, everyone else just kind of systematically went with the uh, the medical, um, I guess, the, the, the medical approach to things, whereas, you know, just come to the appointments, you're going to get everything you need, and then you go and you push the baby out. And that wasn't everybody's story. I went on to have a second child, another very good experience in comparison to my counterparts who were, again, all pregnant at the same time. Uh, I think it had something to do with the water. Uh, and so with, uh, with that birth, um, a couple of months after I had given birth, I ran into a girl who was really excited to have her natural childbirth and she wasn't in the military. And so, uh, or she wasn't in the military or military affiliated. And I, I simply just talked to her about like, how was she preparing? And she said she hadn't done anything to prepare except for go to her doctor's appointments. And right there, I understood that she wasn't likely to get her experience. And then we went on to talk some more and she explained how her doctor had said that her baby was much too big for her to push out naturally and that he was going to have to, you know, do a C-section on her because this, you know, this wouldn't be a safe procedure for her. After all the research uh, that I had done, after all the, you know, the, the preparing for my own childbirth, I understood that this wasn't likely um, a, an accurate statement. And so, you know, like over the, she was, she was due two weeks later. And so like over the next two weeks, you know, I, I would just reach out like, Hey, let me know what I could do for you. And, and then I, I left it alone because there's only so much educating you can do for someone while they're actually pregnant, because a lot of it becomes fear inducing. And so, you know, I went back to my husband and I was like, 
you know, I, I have this, this aching inside of me that I, I just feel like I need to do something, but I know, like, I may not be able to help her, but I have to do something. And so he very casually was like, well, why don't you become a midwife or a doula? And, you know, I grabbed hold of that thought and I was like, I know I'll be a doula, you know, and I'll change the world. And so that kind of started me on um, my whole, my whole doula journey. And, and that within, I want to say within the month, I was already being trained as a doula to start supporting women through their journeys. Wow. What a cool story. I think it's so awesome that you were able to have the, the, I guess, like a more natural experience from the very beginning. Was that just because you were living in Germany that you had that option and you were aware of it? I, I would say it's because I took it because there was a lot of, there was a lot of women who, who were birthing around the same time as me. And they, they had, um, they had the opportunity, but they didn't have the preparation. And I, I, I would, I would really lay heavy on the, the, preparation for birth I think um like really understanding like almost like the physics and the biology of what's going on inside your body like recognizing that you know laying down um if I could say horizontally in a bed is actually counterproductive for the movement of baby out of the body if you could if you think about like how gravity moves gravity moves downward and so if mom is laying on her back trying to push a baby out like that baby actually has to work against gravity uh, because of the opening of mom's body is actually tilted upward with her hips. And so, you know, it's, it's really, it's, it's really the, uh, the preparation behind it. But then uh, us being in Germany, I think um, the, the German hospitals, I would say great things about them. I, I have like little jokes about them because, you know, Germans, like when you think about them, like they tend to be a little bit tougher, like here, take this stick, bite on it. You'll be fine. Uh, but they were they were super sweet and super kind. Uh, and they I would say the biggest difference between the German hospitals and the American hospitals is that they they did not force any kind of um, I, I would say procedures like they they didn't they didn't they weren't heavy on an epidural. They weren't heavy on a C-section like my babies were fairly larger um, for, for my size and stuff like that. And they, they asked me one time, like, Hey, do you want this epidural? And I was like, no. And they never asked me again. Whereas, you know, like I had my first two in Germany and my second two in the States, whereas those births, I saw somebody about every hour asking whether or not I wanted the epidural. So, you know, like, I think with the German experience, I, I was more free to, to be comfortable in my body and like almost in the skin that I was in versus in the States where it was more, much more medicalized. I would say it like that. I have two questions for you. One being a baby that was also born in Germany. My family was air force affiliated. So I was actually born in Garmisch Partenkirchen. Where were you guys uh, stationed? We were about three hours from there. We were in Stuttgart. Okay. And yeah, we would actually vacation in Garmisch. That's fantastic. Oh, small world. I love it. Yeah. And then for the listener, can you kind of give some some key points, differences between what makes a midwife and a doula? Oh, okay, wait, so wait, wait, wait. I've been thinking about this for a second. I, all morning, I had this idea. I wanted to ask, what does a doula do? Uh, uh. <laughs> so much fun. So I, I can answer both of those. Um, so a midwife um, is very much similar to uh, a doctor where the midwife will take care of everything that's medical. Like she'll do the cervical checks and she'll check the heart rate. She'll check the um, the heart rate of mom and baby. She'll check the, the, the all of the things, like everything medical. That's what the, the midwife is going to take care of. The doula is going to take care of everything else. And as I uh, I like to put it, you know, birthing is a physical, mental, emotional, and a spiritual event. And this is like, this is the gambit in which the doula covers. So like physical from like changing positions, like helping mom change positions, doing hip squeezes, you know, rubbing back, you know, uh, releasing pressure, uh, releasing pressure where pressure point, like acupressure points and stuff like that. Um, then mental, like rehearsing the the affirmations and simply like washing her over with the the truth that she really is strong enough to come through this situation and you know this is a momentary light affliction you know in comparison to like 
like the greatness that, you know, is experienced like once baby is out and then the emotional just being available for, you know, the, the rise and fall of the emotions, like, because like you really do go er through every uh, step. And then I would, I would even uh, open that up to like doulas are not just for mom, but doulas are also for dads and the family, depending on where you're birthing. Like when, um, when the father or the support person is in the room, um, me, myself, I, I like to bring them in so that they are doing a lot of the comforting uh, as far as the hip squeezes, as, uh, you know, simply like guiding uh, the partner along so that they are an effective part of this birth experience and not just sitting on the sidelines, like without something to do so that it is a like joint experience. It's a family experience. And then uh, when there's, you know, smaller kids, like having something like if they're, if they're smaller kids or like in-laws that are close by, like keeping them informed of how they can most be helpful. So a lot of times doulas wind up as almost like a crossing guard. Like you come this way, you go that way and, you know, keeping everything running smoothly so that mom can have the experience that she desires. So in your opinion or your experience, do most moms have both kind of the midwife and doula team? Yes. Yes. I would, I would definitely uh, suggest having uh, both as far as, and and the reason why is because the doula will remain as the continuous, uh, the continuous support, whereas a midwife may be a little bit more in and out, depending on where you're birthing. If you're birthing at home, uh, usually the doula shows up first and the midwife gets there, you know, right in time to catch the baby, depending on the midwife. Some midwives do like to tarry uh, a lot with it and stuff like that. And if you're in a hospital setting, which is uh, primarily where I work because of my location and stuff. Um, I work a lot in the hospitals, the, the nursing staff and the doctors, they, they do have other, um, uh, patients to attend to. So it is, it is really the doula's, um, job to stay with mom and keep mom grounded and keep mom focused on her process and not to get, um, I guess pulled away with the emotional aspects of birth. Mm, that's a great explanation. So I have never been around for a birth. I, I guess I was around for mine, but I, I haven't been around when somebody has been born. You know, you see it on TV and um, I, I just, I would love to hear from you. Like what, what is a standard conventional birth like? Because it doesn't strike me as the most peaceful and happy experience. I, I, it seems like a lot of screaming and a lot of pushing and, you know, in a, in a building with a lot of fluorescent lights. And I, I, I'm, I'm really want to understand like what a normal, I guess not normal, but conventional birth looks like, and then we can compare it and contrast it to some of the things that you recommend. I love it. I love it. That's such a great question. Okay. So a lot of you <laughs> like, and if I, if I could point back to, to what you just said, a lot of your um, understanding of birth is because that's what we've uh, we've been groomed to see on television. That's what we've that's what we've heard. You know, those are the scary stories we've been told over the years and stuff. And I think I think the challenge with uh, childbirth and even with women almost identifying with themselves is that we haven't heard a different story. And so. Uh, as a as a doula, I walk alongside as we rewrite, you know, as we rewrite people's stories. That, but as a childbirth educator, I get to inform, you know, uh, families of like the greatness, the the I don't want to say miracle because I feel like that's it's not big enough. Although miracles should be pretty big, you know, like like the the wonder. I'll use it like that. The wonder that is childbirth. So in a I'll, I'll do like a conventional, like in the hospital. So in the hospital, you get to the hospital and it's probably about, you, likely your contractions are coming about five to six minutes apart, look, about five to four minutes apart. You may be about four to five centimeters. You're still halfway to go and you go in, you go into triage, they do a vaginal check, then you know, whether or not you are dilated enough or whether or not your contractions are coming close enough, they'll move you into a room and then they'll keep you in the room. They'll have you sit down in the bed. They'll do a, um, they'll strap you up to the machine. I can't, I can't think of the name of the machine right now, but like everybody knows it's the pink band and the blue band, one to monitor baby, one to monitor mom. And you sit in the bed for the first 30 minutes to an hour. 
and then they tell you you can get up. Now, here's the biggest challenge is because sometimes they don't tell you you can get up. And so women just think like, this is the only thing that I can do because the last instructions I was given was to get in the bed. And so a lot of times women will try to labor in the bed and they wind up in so much pain that the very next step is getting the epidural as soon as possible because they're so uncomfortable. Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, it's uh, it has a lot to do with the like the physics of the body and stuff like that, knowing that gravity is working right now. But if you're sitting on your bottom, then you're closing the door in which baby needs to come out. And so you're actually putting more pressure on yourself by sitting down. And so the epidural comes and then labor slows down some. They let mom sleep for the night. And then first thing in the morning, we push baby out because that's usually according to the uh, the clock that says there's going to be a changeover soon. Uh, if you look at the if you look at the statistics of when babies are born, babies are predominantly born uh, uh, around six o'clock or <laughs> at six p.m. and that's usually because there's a shift change at seven uh, seven a.m. and it, and wow. of course those yeah <laughs> yeah so and and of course those those numbers vary uh, from location because of like well the location will change uh, whatever time they do the shift change and stuff like that so. Um, it is, it is, it is an unfortunate journey when you are unprepared for hospital birth, because, uh, it, it really does become like a conveyor belt, um, where it's just one thing after another, you know, you get in, they tell you they need to break your water. We break the water. We put you on Pitocin. We get the epidural, you know, and if everything doesn't work out, we wind up in a C-section and that can be very damaging for a woman who simply just wants to allow her body to process the way it was designed to process versus, you know, someone who has no other experience, you know, like sometimes women have no other experience than what they've seen on TV. And so they, they just go along with it. Like, this is just the right thing to do. Or they have the, the white coat syndrome where they become fearful of, you know, like of disputing with the white coat. And so we wind up with so many women, and and this is this is something that I'm very specific about. Uh, is they, we wind up with so many women with birth trauma because they have this experience where their what's the word I want to use? Like their authority, their rights, their um, their ability to make decisions for their own body is taken away from them because someone who has more of an education more of a degree, more of authority in that setting says otherwise. And, 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 and so we have women raising children from that position, you know, like, oh, well, they told me I had to do this and they told me I had to do that. And then we send women home with this new baby uh, for six weeks. So uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to paint the picture real fast. So after a woman gives birth, um, if it's a first time mom, usually it's about a 48 hour uh, time period in the hospital, like after the baby is born. And if there is a C-section, it's about 72 hours. But then they send mom home for six weeks before they see her again. So nobody sees mom for six weeks after this baby is born. And in the six weeks, she's she's dealing with sleep deprivation, trying to get the baby to uh, to latch and to breastfeed, to dealing with the, the hormonal shifts of um of like the act like going like like once you lose once the the placenta leaves the body there's a huge hormonal decline and so as, as most people know like once if your hormones your hormones shift so does your mood and everything else and so mom is dealing with all this baggage in the next six weeks but prior to that while she was pregnant she was being seen every two to four weeks while she was pregnant because every month she would get seen roughly around the same time. So it's about a four week time period between her last visit. And now once the baby is here, nobody, nobody like checks on mom and we just leave her to figure it all out. And that can be, that's a huge, how would I say that? It's, it's a huge learning gap to go through it alone where for the last nine to 10 months, you were very reliant and someone else telling you exactly what you needed to do. And so as the doula, I uh, like, I really do like, we really do bridge the gap of understanding versus like what, what a woman understands versus what she's being told and what she actually needs to know. There's like, there's like this huge gray area that not everybody taps into. 
That is so fascinating. Just purely as you describe the conventional birth from a nervous system perspective, going through trauma like that, you're definitely pushed out of your parasympathetic rest and digest, letting things just kind of like happen, unwind and that natural connection to forcing absolutely everything. No wonder it's so much harder on both mom and baby to latch on or to create like an emotional bond or not feel anything, but like terrified leaving that space because I mean, like you said, it's, it's actual trauma. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I would like, and it is, it is actual trauma. I, I, I would definitely say from, from the position, like not specifically childbirth is traumatic, I guess, it, it can be traumatic, but I think it's how we deal with the birthing woman. And like, that's like, that's the whole purpose behind the doula. Like the doula is there to make sure that that mom is getting exactly what she needs, um, whether it be encouragement, whether it be, you know, the, the soft touch, the soft touches, like my, I think overall, my best experience in the labor room is when like you make eye contact with the woman who's going through uh, her contractions and and she looks for a moment horrified and the doula looks back at her and just simply like nods her head, encourages her, hey, you got this. And then it flips that that switch on for her like, OK, OK, so this was scary. And now I'm going to lean into this and and I do have what it takes to get through this contraction. Um, yeah, ab- absolutely. The the whole process is uh, is a joy and it and it could be one that is like overwhelmingly joyful. And then it could be one that's overwhelmingly sorrowful when you're in a, when you're in a space that isn't taking care of like all of the needs of the birthing woman. Mm. Humans are unique in the sense that we have bigger heads and, you know, smaller hips that allow us to walk upright. And we have big brains that help us communicate with one another, which is really amazing, but that makes our childbirth different than other animals. But when I watch, you know, like a puppy, puppies being born, a dog giving birth, a cat giving birth, they seem pretty chill. Like those, those cats and dogs might be experiencing some pain, but they're, they seem like really relaxed. They almost like go off into a corner and kind of take care of themselves. So is it it, contrasting that with, again, what's like in the media and what I have in my mind is what childbirth is just this horribly painful screaming, you know, kind of way to enter the world. It, It can, is that, is that actually what happens or is there a better way that, that it's more mellow and way less painful? There's always a better way. There's always a better way. And I, so I, I I won't say it's an obsession, but I have a theory on why it's so much more painful uh, for uh, humans to birth than it is for other animals. Like you made some great points, like other animals, like you will never see a pregnant deer, like out, out where we are, like there's deer and you, like you see the young ones and they're, you know, hopping across the road and stuff like that. And, but you, you hardly ever see a pregnant deer. You might see some baby deer after, you know, like after they're at a good age and stuff like that. But usually like when other animals are pregnant, they stay away from things that are dangerous. The problem with humans is that like, we actually engage the thing that causes us the challenge. And, and I will, uh, yeah, I'm going to challenge the, the medical system and just say like, that like a lot of the way our medical system is run in America is challenging towards the pregnant woman, you know, like, like just the example I gave, you know, like you, you track a woman for nine to 10 months. And then, you know, like once the baby comes off, there's this steep drop off. That's not good care if you ask me. And, um, and so my theory is the reason why it's so painful for humans is because there's too much interaction with others. From the from the point, um, all right. So I'm gonna take it. A, I'm gonna take it like a little bit old world for you. So um, prior to 1853, most women were giving birth at home, right? Prior to 1853, uh, most women were giving birth at home. In 1853, Queen Victoria of England had uh, she she invited chloroform into her birth room. And it was for about like her, I want to say it was like for her eighth, like seventh or eighth child. And so you have to ask yourself, so the Queen of England invites chloroform into the birth room. What is chloroform? Why is it used? And so chloroform would, would basically knock you out. And 
uh, and it would knock you out in not so soothing way. And you, you wouldn't have any, uh, you wouldn't have any remembrance of it. And the, the idea was that it was, it was a pain reliever, but really it wasn't because it, it sent women in a kind of psychosis when it was performed in the States. So in England, when it was done, um, it was done by a Dr. Snow and it was really a, uh, it was really a sign of like the elite status, like how, like how, uh, how enticing it must have been for women to, to the idea so that they would not have to suffer during childbirth, right? And so by the time it hits the States, it hits the States in like the early 1900s. And this is all around like the women's, the women's rights time. And, and it became a demand. It became a demand in the U.S. economy. Like women deserve this tool to get through childbirth. Now, the big argument prior to uh, Queen Victoria using it was uh, the church, right? The, the Church of England said, well, it is like, it's, it's like sacrilegious. I'll say it like that. It's sacrilegious to relieve a woman of her pain during childbirth because that's what the Bible says. And, and I would dispute heavily what, what uh, that scripture uh, meant in the beginning of the Bible and stuff like that, because there's so many different things about that scripture that doesn't really line up with the actuality of a woman's, um, I guess, birth experience, if I could say it like that. And so the, the conversation becomes, why would the Queen of England, right, because she has so many people underneath her, why would she bring something like this into her birth room? Well, when we're talking about queens giving birth, like now we have to go back even further than the 1800s. And now we're thinking like old, old world where, you know, they're living in castles and they have their subjects coming in from afar to verify the kingship of the next, you know, the next child born, the next prince that comes into uh, the legacy. And so the queen actually had to give birth in a room full of men who were waiting on her vagina to do what it was supposed to do. And so when you think about birthing in a setting like that, the first thing that comes to mind, like knock me over the head, get this baby out. I don't want to be in this room anymore. And so like when we, when we take a stance in, when we, when we take a look at like how, how we got to this place of hospitalized birth, like even even in the like the 1700s, like midwifery and medicine, they weren't even part of the same conversation because anything that had to do with a woman was a woman's business. And so they were they it was like fair game for the the midwives to take care of the women. When we get into the 1800s, this is when like the the how, how you say like the medical field started to expand and they 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 it was it was almost like a race to can I say like that? It was almost like a race to the vagina. Like how, how far can, how fast and how far can we get into this vagina to extract what we need and move on to the next, uh, to the next woman. Part of this problem comes, um, the fever. So there was an epidemic of fevers around the same time where, um, the queen was giving birth. So, uh, in the 1800s, like the, the challenge with childbirth then, which is much, is very similar to the challenge of childbirth now, uh, infection uh, and fever, infection that led to fever was one of the highest causes of death. Well, the problem with, you know, this was actually, it was the medical professionals that were passing the infection from body to body because we had uh, young doctors who were attending to, uh, they were attending within the morgue and then they would go into the birth room and they would not wash their hands or they would not wash their tools. And so they were actually part of the problem. And so when we, when we talk about childbirth and it was like, oh, women were dying. That, that's the biggest argument in the, in, in like the doula community. Like, oh, women are dying. Like natural birth is actually not healthy for women. And it's like, well, like that, that would be the equivalent of saying like, you, we shouldn't breathe for ourselves because our body is designed to do this. And if we understand how our body works and we give our body what it needs, then it's going to perform to the capacity in which it was designed to do so. Um, and so um, besides, besides fever, it was, um, besides fever, it was, 
what were the other ones? It was fever. And then it was heart, like heart problems. Oh, hemorrhage. Hemorrhage was the other one. Uh, but hemorrhage is also one of the, the problems like that are still facing women in the birth room now. But that that also comes with a part of the process of how they do it now. Once the baby is really re, not removed, or, uh, I'll say it like that. Once the baby is released from the uterus, um, a, a lot of times in hospitals, what they'll do is they'll go in and they'll start to tug the placenta out. Well, the way the b- body is designed, the body will continue to contract until uh, the placenta is all the way out, literally pushing the placenta out until it can't stay in anymore. Um, But when we force the placenta out by pulling on it, even if it's just a short pull, you know, uh, what we do is we leave like, if you could imagine a dinner plate, uh, we leave a dinner plate size hole in on the inside of this woman's uterus. Now that takes quite a bit of time to close up versus us allowing the contractions to slowly close uh, to uh, for the uterus to close down around itself so that the body itself is closing those areas where the placenta would have been, if that makes sense. I don't know if I explained that well. Did, did you catch that one? Oh my gosh. I have like full body chills right now. I'm and thinking to myself, like these men in the past and future and current, like stay in your lane. S- yeah. Steam is coming out of Bethany's ears right now. Oh, the female <laughs> repression is so real. I'm worried about my safety. <laughs> and 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 so my my husband has he has dueled me through the best uh the best births. And and so like I I would definitely say like men are definitely a necessary presence in the birth room. And I think that it's important that men understand their role in the birth room, you know. Uh, and so they, they have a saying in the doula community. It's, it's not that, uh, the secret about birth is not that it's painful. It's that women are entirely strong. Like, and when we, when we get to a place where we recognize that each contraction that a woman experiences, it's not something that is coming against her to harm her, but it's something that's being revealed about her. It's something that's coming up out of her. Like literally the contraction, it's an internal strength. Like if you could think about it like that. And so like those contractions aren't coming because you can't do this. Those contractions are coming because you can do this. It's, it's every challenge that comes up in life. Like you don't, you're not faced with any challenge because you can't do it. It's you're faced with that challenge so that you can grow in order to be able to do it. And it's really just, you know, giving women the tools that they need in order to, 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 to grow like that. I have a question about saving placentas. Maybe it's a little bit taboo to talk about. Have you done that with any of yours? Fun. So I'm actually, uh, so no, I have not done that with any of mine, but I've had a couple clients do so. Um, and they have had raving reviews about the, like just how much it helped to balance their mood after, um, after childbirth. And so, uh, this, this summer I'm actually, uh, I'm actually working on my certification to, uh, become a placenta encapsulator. I think they're like, I know there to be great, great benefits as far as, um, so I guess let me explain uh, the process, because if I just say placenta encapsulation, people are going to be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, so placenta encapsulation after the placenta is so understanding the placenta, I'm going to take it uh, even a step further. So um, I have I have small kids. And so I I, uh, I have small kids and I have one particular child who is seven years old and she has decided that when I die, she is going to become, she's going to take over my business and she's going to help women all around the world. And so she asked a lot of great questions. I wish that she would choose to um, help women all over the world while I was still alive and not just wait for me to die. But, you know, like it's, it's her own thing. So, um, but so, uh, so I, I tend to explain things for seven year old. Like, so I'm going to, uh, I'm going to explain the placenta at a, at a very small understanding. So, a placenta is essentially like the pantry for baby. So if baby is growing well and they are self-sufficient and they have all access pass to the pantry and the pantry being the placenta. So it is filled with everything baby needs, all the vitamins, all the nutrients, all the uh, everything that baby could possibly need. Uh, of course, you know, in 
medical terms, the placenta does more than just store stuff, but for you know the, the common sake of it. Um, and so while the placenta is growing, while baby and the placenta are growing, uh, the placenta is actually taking everything that it needs in order to sustain baby. So the uterus, uh, the uterus is the organ in which the, the baby is formed inside. And then the mother's body, check this out, it's so fascinating. The mother's body actually grows another organ in, in and of itself. So it grows this other organ and then it grows a baby within that organ. Uh, and in, in my head, like I just, I love the truth that, you know, my soft tissue makes bones like that. It's, it's phenomenal. It's a phenomenal truth about a woman's body. Wow. And so with the, yeah, right. Right. So with the placenta, the placenta is, is drawing out of mom's body, everything that it needs. So all the vitamins, all the nutrients, all, you know, everything that you can think of, it's taking it all out of mom's body. The challenge is that as women, we haven't really been educated on what baby needs. So we make decisions that go in line with, I'm eating for two. And so now we just start to increase our food and we just we just eat way too much. And the truth about it is it's, it's not about it's not about eating for two. The truth is you're not eating for two because if you think about the size of the baby, the baby is only going to be born at most, you know, anywhere between six and nine pounds. You know, there, there may be a, a few scattered that are a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller and stuff like that, but the average is about six to nine pounds. And so, and I would probably even say six to eight pounds, but whatever. Um, so the, the, the challenge is making sure that mom has everything she needs for the pregnancy. So the, the, you know, that conversation is, is she eating the entire rainbow? You know what I mean? Like, is she eating all of the, you know, those, those vitamins, all of those trace minerals, all of those, you know, all the things that, you know, we, we look at and from an inner city perspective, we look at is like, oh, this is too much. Like, like, why is this like, why, why do I have to be so extra when I'm pregnant? You know, like, why do I have to eat so well when I'm pregnant? And the truth of the matter is you were supposed to be eating that way before you got pregnant so that while you were pregnant, like, this was this was an easier process. A lot of times women go into their pregnancy and they're already deficient in minerals and nutrients in their own body. And so they they take a sharp decline uh, during the pregnancy. And so they, you know, like just taking prenatals is sometimes not enough because prenatals don't always have everything that that you need it. But we're told to take the prenatals and we're told and we get the little white bottle, at least out here. We get the little white bottle with pink letters on it and, you know, everything is supposed to be okay as long as I take this vitamin, the, like this, this prenatal uh, vitamin that is actually a lot of um, synthetic, you know, synthetic forms of vitamins. And it's like, like, why, why, like, why don't we know more? So I spend a lot of time on social media, just educating women simply on the basics, you know, like not so much on the birth and the, you know, the birth and the pregnancy and the child, you know, all of that stuff, but like, Hey, like, how are we maintaining our body? How are we maintaining our relationships? How are we maintaining like ourself in light of this other thing? Like the pregnancy is great, but you need to be able to sustain once that once baby has come out, because if you're, if you're already deficient, like once baby comes out and once that placenta leaves, now that placenta was a source for your own body for a period of time. But once all of those vitamins and those nutrients come out, now this is where we, we, we start like tap dancing on the realm of like postpartum depression because mom has experienced such a steep hormonal decline and it's affecting her mood. It's affecting her thoughts. It's affecting like the way she does life and how she is able to nurture baby in that postpartum season. And so in walks placenta encapsulation and the process of placenta encapsulation, which was what I originally started talking about, is um, like they take the placenta, they um, they dry it out uh, at a very specific temperature, a temperature that's warm enough to kill any uh, bacteria that may be there and stuff like that. Uh, and then, so let me take one step backwards. So if you are birthing in a hospital, 
Uh, once the placenta is out, the placenta has to be bagged and put on ice immediately. And then whoever your encapsulator is has to come pick it up so that they can start their process. If you're birthing at home, of course, you can have your placenta encapsulator walk into the house and then just start the process. Mm. But it is, it, is, uh, it is dried out and then it is, um, it is basically it's turned to dust and then it's placed into capsules. Uh, and there's, there's no, uh, some, some people do it a little bit differently because most people will encapsulate it, but others just want it in a powder form and they'll put it into a milkshake or they'll put it into some oatmeal. And, uh, usually there's no taste that's associated with it and stuff. Um, uh, but you're able to re-ingest everything that was already in that pantry, all those, all those minerals, all those nutrients, all those vitamins that mom's body, um, has just lost, we get to take that back in. And so that 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 helps a tremendous amount in the recovery in the postpartum time. Wow, that's super interesting. What a great explanation. Okay, so we have, it seems like we have on the one hand, this is what a hospital birth is. And, you know, it can be a lot of trauma. You might get pulled out with forceps. I don't know if they still do that anymore. You might get whisked away in a, you know, glass box and not really get a lot of great skin to skin contact. Um, you know, and, and I question, you know, the, the traumatic events of coming into a building where, you know, people are getting sick and dying and what metaphysically that does to a new baby. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have like a home birth. And I'm picturing like there is a pool, uh, kind of a pool set up in the living room and they've, you've got the doula and the midwife. And then you have other people who are like chanting in the background, and like they're smoking peyote in the background or whatever. Like, like th those are two extremes. What are some things that people can be thinking about as far as options that fall somewhere in the middle in that spectrum and how they want to create their own unique birth? Fantastic. Um, th so the idea of someone chanting in the background is just really, <laughs> And, and I'm sure I'm sure that happens uh, at some births and stuff like that. Um, so if we if we were talking an in between of both of those, uh, we could um, we would go to the birth center that the birth center is it's comfortable like a home birth, but it's um, it's around medical professionals like it's it's around a, a full team of medical professionals and they have everything that they need. Uh, the only reason to do um, a birth center is usually uh, someone's home may not be big enough to hold the birthing pool, you know. Uh, so that's really the reason why. Uh, or, you know, they may associate some fears with being at home uh, to do uh, like a home birth and stuff like that. I know uh, for me, most of the time, my, my clients, like the, the husbands will feel like, oh, well, you know, that just doesn't feel safe. So, you know, instead of doing a home birth, let's, you know, let's do the... Um, Let's do the birth center. So birth centers are fantastic. Usually they have a great big queen size bed with a large uh, tub. They have the shower, the bathroom, the whole nine yards. And then they have a large space for uh, mom to birth. In. And I guess it really does depend on the, uh, the birth center. But the specific ones that I work in around here, um, and I would say the specific one that I work in around here, that's how it's laid out. Um, and then it's also important to know like what is available in your specific state. Like I live in the state of Maryland, uh, where birth centers are, are not very common. There are two birth centers, um, and one is attached to a hospital. So there are questions of whether or not that, that should actually be considered a birth center because it is so close to the hospital that the hospital has, um, specific, policies that influence the, that birth center and stuff. And so a birth center is I, ideally something that's standalone, not attached to a hospital and stuff like that. So not, and, and then also knowing that in some states that it's actually, it's actually against the law to practice midwifery outside of the hospital. So home births in some states are not even available. Wow. Can you tell us maybe some of the common questions or issues that, that people would have when they're first exploring this? Like what are the most common concerns that somebody would come to you with in the very beginning when they're trying to decide how to approach the birth? So uh, because of uh, the location I live in uh, outside, of, outside of DC, the, the, the main concern is the maternal mortality rate. And this is always a challenging one for me because um, when we start talking the maternal mortality rate, it's actually not an ideal time to talk to a woman about it while she's pregnant. Uh, it's just the same way, you know, like talking to her about like some of the challenges she may experience in the hospital 
you you actually can't get into the the nitty gritty like while a woman is pregnant because it's it's sometimes very fear inducing and so it can provoke the wrong uh, the wrong response and so a lot of times uh, the 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 major concern is the maternal mortality rate right. So it, it almost made me, it almost made me cry over it and stuff like that, because a lot of times women are coming to me just because they want to live through pregnancy. They want to live through their childbirth. And that alone is, is traumatic. You know what I mean? Like just for a woman to think like, oh, I might die. And so who do I get on my team that will make sure that I live through this process? Uh, and so as a doula, my, my job is to take this this very big matter, you know, because the maternal mortality rate, like we, we are um, within the United States, the maternal mortality rate is um, we're up there with, we're, we're number one on uh, the most developed countries, you know, uh, for maternal mortality. And so when you, when you think about it, like how can our country of all countries be number one, when we're talking about maternal mortality, when we should be so far advanced uh, in comparison to other countries and stuff. And so um, the big, the, like my big approach is, you know, really just bringing it back to, to home center. Okay. So uh, what do we want? We want uh, as close to a natural birth. Most of my clients, they want as close to a natural birth as they can get because uh, they are going to the hospital. And so, you know, like I, I don't mind most, most women won't mind being in the hospital uh, but they don't want to be forced into a C-section. So they're really trying to swing the pendulum so that it, it it lands in their direction and stuff like that. And we don't have to, you know, go over that tipping edge because once uh, once a woman has a C-section, the likelihood of her having a, re- uh, uh, a reoccurring C-section is is more than 60% because, um, because there's risk associated with it. And so uh, a first-time mom who is concerned about one not dying and two not having a C-section, it's, it's really because she wants to extend her ability to reproduce. And a lot of times with first time moms, if you don't have the support, like it's it's a natural progression into the, the operating room because there are so many things that like can be done to, to kind of work with your body in order to get baby out sooner rather than later. Um, but yeah, most of the time people are coming to me to avoid C-section, avoid um, avoid, uh, an epidural until they need it and stuff like that. So we're working a lot with information and education and, and really like the comfort measures, making sure that the support person has, um, like me, the doula would be part of the support team, but the support person would be like the spouse, um, or the significant other and stuff like that, making sure the support person has the tools that they need to, to be, the best advocate in those situations, because sometimes not all doulas are able um, to be an advocate. I know like part of the, the, the doula mantra is, you know, we're advocates for, you know, we're advocates for birth, but in a hospital setting, you know, like you really do have to be mindful because you advocating for, you know, your client can actually get you pushed out of the room very quickly if the doctor doesn't feel that you are a beneficial part of this process and so uh there's there's a lot of there's a lot of fine line dancing that doulas do and stuff like that but mostly it is um pulling pulling women back into the the strength can I say it like that the the strength and the knowing that their body is designed to do this and so like if we just lean into that direction um it doesn't have to be you know the fear and the horror of what we've seen on TV or what we've heard from other people's experience. Like even if we, um, and I I will, I will, I will give my own personal experience. My great grandmother, she had nine children and she was twilighted, which is, um, which is a step past uh, chloroform where it's chloroform and another chemical that it it sends you into psychosis. And so a lot of times, like, I don't know if you guys remember where uh, like the, the conversation in history when women were being locked up for psychosis and they were being locked up for, uh, you know, back talking their husbands, you know, I would have been in jail a bunch of times. So uh, <laughs> female <defended>. hysteria. <laughs> yeah. For hysteria. That's the word. So, but now I'm going to, I'm going to take you through, um, my grandmother's journey. She, where she had nine kids and eventually her older kids were raising the younger kids 
And we now had this dysfunctional household, but it was because of the birth experience that my, uh, my, my great grandmother, I'm sorry, my great grandmother had where she was medicated and she was drugged during her childbirth. If you could imagine a woman walks into the hospital and she is fully pregnant in her right mind, but she does have to get this uh, baby out. And during the, the early 1900s, like, and this time, like everybody, like it was, you know, like it was a sign of like, again, social status to birth in hospitals or, you know, we were made to believe like you couldn't birth outside the hospital or something terrible would happen. Where in contrast, once we started birthing in hospitals, the maternal mortality uh, rate actually skyrocketed. But back to my great grandmother's story, like when she was going in, she like because she had so many kids, the procedure was done so many times on her. And so now she's experiencing hysteria. But when you walk into the hospital and you're nine months pregnant, you know you're in labor, and then they put you to sleep, whether it's like whether it's consented or against your will, they put you to sleep. And the next thing you remember is you wake up like a bat out of hell from this this uh, this deep sleep. If you could think of like people who have to go under for surgery and stuff like that. It's not always a smooth transition awake, but now the big difference that she's experiences is because before she was pregnant and now she's not, there's no baby in her belly. And if you think about the, about the error that I'm talking about, remember when everybody would say, oh, we're going to the hospital, we're going to go to the nursery to see the baby. The reason why babies were taken to the nursery is because moms experience this traumatic birth where they're put to sleep. Uh, and the baby is forcefully removed from mom's body. And now the baby doesn't have, you know, mom to take care of them. And so they have to be wrapped up, swaddled, put in the nursery until mom wakes up. This is also the time where they were switching babies on accident. Uh, but then like you get, you get, you get the mom who's waking up out of this, you know, out of almost like a coma. And now everything has changed. They have to bring her her baby. And that's only if she's not absolutely hysterical from what she just experienced. Her body is aching in ways that it wasn't supposed to ache because they were using things like forceps and, you know, they were much more uh, aggressive with her with her body because she was not, you know, she was not responsive. And when we're when we're talking about twilighting, twilighting, it would um, the way it was the way it was done, it wouldn't it would it would erase your memory, but it would not necessarily like relieve the pain. Like sometimes women, like their bodies were actually still responding to all of the pain that they were experiencing and they would then begin to attack themselves or the, the physician. And a lot of times women were like handcuffed and, you know, placed in like something like you, you said, like a glass box where they couldn't hurt themselves or anyone else in order to get this baby out. And so when we when we look back at a generation of women who have been birthing with no other options, you know, like, and so the, the whole twilighting that went out of play after the 1920s and stuff like that. But the effects of it was still there because my great grandmother passed on her birth trauma to her daughters and they passed it on to their daughters. Eventually, you know, like when it came my turn to birth and I'm talking about a natural birth, everybody's looking at me like I'm, you know, absolutely crazy because it's the worst experience in the world because nobody has ever done anything different because that one traumatic birth story was enough to shape generations after it. And so a lot of times we really do have to get back to the basics of like, what is it that our body like, what is it that our body does? Why, why does it do it? And how can we work with our body to maximize its performance? Wow. That is such a powerful story. How do, how do the costs of something conventional versus natural kind of compare? I, I love this question. Um, and it's, I guess it's, it's, it's sometimes like a heartbreaking one because, um, like, because you don't want to think something as personal as childbirth is like, is something that is being taken advantage of. But a lot of times it is like um, when, when we talk about a, when we talk about a C-section, a C-section will run you about like 10 to 12 K uh, for a C-section. And some may, some may say like, Oh, that's not too much. 
Um, but then when we talk like an epidural, it's going to run maybe like seven to nine K. But then when we talk a natural childbirth, it's going down to about three to five K. And this is all like hospital birthing. You know what I mean? This is all about, this is all, this is just about hospital birthing. And, and a lot of times that cost is covered by insurance. Now, when we look at the money that it costs for the epidural or even the C-section, um, what, what's covered underneath that is the anesthesiologist, right? So the, and, and so part of it, like the three to five K for natural childbirth, well, that, that is simply like the hospital stay. They got to feed you. They got to put you up in a bed. You know, people are going to be attending to you. So you got to pay, you got to, you know, you got to pay the nurses and the doctors for what they do. So it, it, it takes that big bump up to seven to nine K when we start talking about the, uh, the, the, the anesthesiologist. Now the anesthesiologist, they're going to get paid in the hospital, like, uh, or by the hospital, whether or not they perform, you know, uh, epidurals or not, you know, like, and so it becomes in the hospital's best interest to make sure that every woman who might want an epidural has more than enough access to the epidural so that that, you know, that anesthesiologist, their paycheck is now covered by the insurance and not the hospital. And so this is, you know, one of those, those pocket saving things. And ultimately like hospitals are big business. The whole reason why in the 1800s, you know, everybody was racing to, to get midwives out of midwifery uh, and, you know, bring in the, the, the era of obstetrics is, is because like, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a financial move, you know, like it's, it's not something, it's not something that is, um, it's not something that is that there's no profit in. A lot of times, like with doulas, there are so many doulas who are low cost, and and it, and they're low cost not because like the work that we do is not absolutely necessary, but it's because most most families they don't understand the value of what a doula is doing, and like like a lot of times in the inner city, like people just don't have like the resources to pay, you know, their medical bills and then pay for a doula and stuff like that. But if you, if you, if you understood like how much of a barrier, like a doula, just a doula's presence, I would say just a doula's presence is making for you in your birthing season, uh, then you would definitely invest uh, your money wisely and stuff. Mm. Wow. I have personally learned so much from this conversation. This has been so much fun. Um, I would like to ask you a different version of our normal last question, which is what, what is one simple thing you would tell to maybe like a young family who's looking into having children? What, what is one simple tip you would like to leave for that family? One simple tip to leave for families who are looking to have children. I would say unity I think unity in vision is primary uh, and, and then support. Like, yeah, that, that is it right there. Unity and support. Like I think once, um, once the, the team, once home base is solid, like whatever their vision is, whether it's to have one baby or, you know, or, or five, you know, like as long as they're united in their, you know, their convictions about like, you know, how many children and how they're going to do it and then finding the right support team. And I would, I would definitely be selective about your support team because, yeah, because, you know, like small families, they need, they need the, the right team around them in order to support them through that journey. I love that. That's a lovely answer. Where can people go to find you, connect with you, maybe work with you or find all the great courses you have online? Excellent. Um, so if you are on Facebook, I am at In Love Birthing um, and on Instagram at In Love Births. And then if you are looking into any educational uh, needs, I'm at inlovebirthing.thinkific.com. That's awesome. We will link to all of that in the show notes. Jen, uh, this has been such an awesome conversation. Thank you so much for all of your work and thank you for bringing this information out so that people can understand what their options are and, and choose a, a birth that is really meaningful and powerful, not only for them, but for the child who's entering this world. So thank you so very much for everything that you do. Um, we're so honored that you would come on our show and talk to us about it. Excellent. Thank you so much. Y'all have a great day. Yeah, you too. Thanks, Jen. And this has been another episode of Boundless Body Radio.